welcome everyone to our second installment of our Water Quality Wednesdays events um, presented by the Ohio State University Water Quality Extension Associates. Um, and this topic is cover crops and water quality. Um, so I'm your host, Rachel Cochran, and I'm also gonna be speaking first. Um, second, we have Sarah Noggle, um, a and Extension Educator for Paulding County. Um, and then Jason Hartshue, a and Educator for Crawford County, followed by Les Seiler, who is a farmer from Fulton County. So um, our upcoming webinars at the end of the month, we have a, another Water Quality Wednesday for best management practices for water quality. Um, March 3rd, we have a litigation update with Peggy Hall. And April 14th, we are gonna be talking about water quality in the Western Lake Erie Basin. So if you wanna register for one or all of those sessions, you can scan this QR code, or you can go to go.osu.edu slash water quality Wednesday, which I believe Bridget just dropped in the chat. So I'm your host, like I said, I cover Paulding, Defiance, and Van Wert counties. Um, two of our moderators are Bowdoin Fisher and Bridget Moneymaker. Um, their contact information is up on the screen right now, along with the counties that they cover. So as I said, um, I cover Paulding, Defiance, and Van Wert counties. And today I'll be briefly discussing how cover crops can affect water quality. So cover crops can have many effects on different aspects of your farm, but today we're just gonna gloss over some of the direct impacts to water quality specifically. So I've chosen six of what I think are the most relevant impacts. Um, so cover crops can prevent soil erosion. They can absorb excess nutrients from the soil and then return them later in the season for the next crop to use. They can increase soil aggregate stability they can compete with weeds. And lastly, they can help to alleviate compaction that you might have in your fields. So first we're gonna talk about how cover crops can prevent soil erosion. Um, as you can see in the top photo, this field is dealing with some erosion from the water that's moving through the field. So how can cover crops help to prevent this? First, do they keep the soil covered, which in of itself will prevent soil particles from being carried by wind or water to nearby waterways. And the growing cover crop or the residue also slows down the velocity of that water that is moving across the field, which prevents the soil from leaving. The vegetation covering the surface also protects it from the impact of raindrops on the soil surface. And roots in the soil help to hold that soil in place, even if the cover crop isn't actively growing. So together, these actions improve water quality by keeping nutrients attached to soil particles in the field and not in our ditches and waterways. If you look at the bottom picture, we can see that the crop in this field is preventing the erosion of that soil and allowing just the water to leave the field, which is what we want. The next benefit of cover crops is that they can absorb excess nutrients from the soil profile so they aren't lost. And just a quick note, we're referring to our grass and non-legume broadleaf species with this one. Um, legumes can provide nitrogen for the following cash crop, but we won't absorb it from the field, which we'll touch on in a minute. So your different cover crop species can take up the nutrients that are left in the field after you harvest your cash crop, preventing losses from the field over that winter period. Uh, the losses could either be through runoff or by changing to nutrient forms that would be unusable by our future cash crops. And in addition, this can help reduce our fertilizer costs during the growing season which helps our bottom line. And because we may not need to apply as much fertilizer, that lowers the risk of having our surface applied fertilizer run off. So as I mentioned in the last slide, our legume crops fix nitrogen into the soil as they grow, which is one way that cover crops can return nutrients to the soil. Another way is through their decomposition. So as these plants die and decompose, uh, the nutrients that were held in that plant material make their way back into the soil where our next crop can take them up. Different species of cover crops have different carbon to nitrogen ratios, so it may take longer for some species to return those nutrients than it'll take other species. And the cover crop basically acts as a temporary bank account for these nutrients. So it takes them up in the fall, holds on to them, and then releases them in the spring for the cash crop. 
Another important function of cover crops is improve, improving soil structure by increasing soil aggregate stability. So one way they can do this is by working with fungi in the soil to create a biological glue called glomalin, um, which is a material that holds soil aggregates together. So this can decrease erosion and soil losses by holding the soil particles together. If you look at the bottom picture, we see someone has done the slake test where the soil on the right, which is B, um, is from a field that doesn't use cover crops. And the picture on the left is from a cover crop field, which is A. Uh, the soil from the cover crop field is holding together better in a container of water than the other field. And this is because the soil on the left has better aggregate stability. So this is an easy test to do on your own farm as well to see how your soil holds together compared to other fields you might have or a neighbor's field. And in addition, decomposing material from the cover crops can increase soil carbon, which is a key component of soil organic matter. So over time, using cover crops to increase soil organic carbon will improve your soil organic matter levels. Um, they also improve the water holding capacity of the soil. So the water that hits your field will penetrate the soil and slowly filter out to our ditches and streams rather than running off the surface. Um, where so that it won't carry those soil particles and nutrients out of the field. Cover crops can also be very good competitors with weeds, both while alive and after termination. So some species um, have allelopathic traits like cereal rye, which chemically prevent weeds from germinating or growing. Other species have the ability to form a thick mat and choke the weeds out by preventing light from reaching the soil surface, like some of our clover species. Either way, cover crops can help to decrease the use of herbicides and the costs associated with them. And by decreasing herbicide use, we can lower the chance of the applied herbicides entering our ditches and waterways. The last benefit I'm gonna to touch on is that cover crops can help to alleviate compaction in our fields. As you can see in the left photo and the bottom right, using cover crops like radishes with large tap roots, can penetrate multiple inches into our soil and break up compaction layers over time. Even cover crops with fibrous root systems like most grasses can do this by reaching laterally and vertically through the soil as we see in the top right picture. So having these roots pushing into the soil can also help to improve infiltration, which decreases the likelihood that water will run off our fields and take our precious soil and nutrients. So for the take home message, I want you to think of cover crops as just another tool in the toolbox for improving water quality. And for more information about what you can gain from using cover crops, I've listed a few resources below and I'll post links in the chat box as well. So thank you. Here's my contact information. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions and I will do my best to answer them. And our next speaker of the day will be Sarah Noggle and our extension educator for Paulding County. All right, thanks, Rachel. Um, hopefully you're seeing my correct slide. And as Rachel transitioned and talked about some of those benefits based on water quality, I think some of the things we need to help people with is what do I use and, and how do I decide which cover crops? One tool that we can help you with is um, a cover crop tool selector that is made for part of the Midwest. And so I'm going to share some information about that and then some other resources for today. So the cover crop tool selector is part of the Midwest Cover Crops Council, which Ohio State is part of. And through a grant, we've had the opportunity to update this cover crop tool selector. To find this information, you'll go through mccc.msu.edu and backslash selector tool. And so one of the things that happened in late 2020 is that we updated this version. It hadn't been updated for about 10 years. We made this much more mobile friendly, and so you can see things through your cell phone much easier. So to go through that cover crop tool selector, I think it's important to give people information on how to start. And I think doing your homework is key, whether it's using this tool or some of the other tools, working with other farmers, connecting with small groups, um, talking with people and learning, that's key to getting started. Cover crops give you um, an opportunity to have a game plan. And I think while you might be raising um, other crops, cover crops are one that you need to do your homework. So to start, 
we'll open that website on your computer or your cell phone. And it looks like this screen here. What you'll do across the top are tabs. The first one says home. The second tab says getting started. The third is selector tools. And we will choose that selector tool option. Given that screen, there are two other options. There's a row crop tool and a vegetable crop tool. Ohio doesn't have enough information to make that vegetable crop tool work. But if you are farming in um, that lower Michigan area, that vegetable crop tool is available for those Michigan areas. So we're going to click on the row crop tool. And what that does is bring up another screen. And so it, it looks like this one where you can see that cover crop decision tool. And we'll start with basics. One thing that I wanted to share is um, you can go in any order as you use this tool. And so you don't have to start in the exact order that I am right now. So the first thing that we recommend for you to start is to choose your state and county. And those are very simple. As you go through, choose the two options. And so as we look at those, we see the, um, the two county or the state and county. And I just use my county, for example, in this first one. And I think people can use this, like I said, as an educational aspect. What that does when you select your um, state and county, it's going to give you all the cover crops as a list. And while this is a very basic option, we are incorporating in things like weather data factors, the fly free date, reliable establishment, that freeze moisture risk to establishment. Along the left are some blue options for each species. And so I call this the education part. You can click on each one of those species. What that does is give you more information into that before you even know which ones you're going to select. And so if we were to click just on um, winter barley as a cover crop, you have to click the drop down options to see the expanded information. You can also print this as a PDF um, for more information for you. The other thing that we have added is a link to other resources at the bottom of each one of those pages. And then if there are specific things based on that cover crop species for Ohio, for example, if you are in an equip program or you are in that Western Lake Erie Basin and you're looking for something that is overwintering, sometimes you need to look at those options and we have those links listed. The next thing that you'll see that is new to the cover crop tool selector this time is that um, display. One thing I highlighted is it floats around the screen, but every time you change a, an option on this, there's a button that says see updated results. Make sure you click that. It does not update without that. Well, I wish there was a better way that it just automatically did that. You do have to click that see updated results. So after I have some education and I know a little bit about those cover crops, I would start with saying, what are my goals? The cover crop tool selector has an option to add up to three goals for your um, species. I tell people to start small and start simple and choose just one goal. The goals that we have an opportunity to look at are, would this cover crop be an erosion fighter? Is, does it have a mechanical forage harvest value? Is it an opportunity for good grazing? Is there a grain seed harvest value? Should this be interseeded with a cash crop? Is it something I need lasting residue? Do I need it to scavenge for nitrogen? Or is it going to be a nitrogen source for me? Does it have quick growth? Is it a soil builder or a weed fighter? Sometimes one of the things I tell people is that what my definition of some of these would not be necessarily your definition. These definitions are based on the SARE guidelines. And so I'll show that publication in just a second. As you look at those goals, you just choose the first one. And I, like I said, start simple. The goals are tied to managing cover crops profitably, the third edition, which is one of our SARE um, publications. That publication is listed here. It's a free download, or you can purchase that for $19 plus shipping by going to this website. So again, the definitions on how those goals are selected are based on this booklet. So as we look at that, um, once a goal is chosen, you have to understand how that key and that 
sort order works with the new selector tool. It defaults to a sort order of excellent as four to poor as zero. And you can see that I've circled those different um, number ratings at the top of um, the selector tool when you get to that. The other thing that has been added is um, besides some of the species, it will show a snowflake. And that means that this could possibly be um, one of the options for frost seeding. So if it shows a snowflake beside those, frost seeding is an option for that. So as we continue on to add those goals, you can add a first, a second, and a third goal. What that does is re-rank, as long as you collect, update this, the tool, um, that listing by four or three, and it pulls those to the top of the list. Now, one thing that I get the question is, um, well, there are five species that are listed as a four as I selected this goal, which doesn't mean the top one is better. No, they're actually just in alphabetical order based on that number four ranking. And so again, realize that, that it's, it's alphabetical order. Um, it doesn't mean that the top one is the best option. I think you have to look at a lot of other factors when you are deciding on those. And so um, looking at those are key. So as you add more goals, you need to click the plus or that plus button where it says add another goal to get more. So I talk about um, getting more in depth. So we looked at goals and maybe you had a basic idea of, okay, these are the things, but now I need to know what is my cash crop rotation that I'm working with? What about the drainage? I think when you start with cover crops, some of these things you have to get right. You need to look at things like herbicide residue, and you need to look at things like, what is the drainage of this field? One of the things that people, I think, sometimes assume is that if drainage is one of those options, the cover crop will just um, solve that problem. But sometimes you have to start before that and look at potential water quality, looking at tiling and other options. So um, that next option again is showing the cash crop and um, you'll put in an approximate planting and harvest date. The more information you give, the better that selector tool will delve into your results. And so You'll just click what is the cash crop. It has everything from um, corn and soybeans to um, silage. You'll put a planting date in and an approximate harvest date. And so what that does is um, bring in some results on the chart that you'll see. The other thing for drainage is all you're doing is saying, is this um, a mux type soil? Is it moderately well drained? what are my options? Again, don't forget to click that see updated results. If um, there's a, another flooding option that says, is this tiled, yes or no, based on this. And so you're going to be going through specifically thinking about maybe a field that you are looking at seeding cover crops in. And then the last thing is the flooding options. Does it, does it not flood at all? Is it brief up to seven days, long up to, to seven days? I guess sometimes with this option, people put in how they wish that field were functioning, but just realize that, hey, if it's a wet field and it's not tiled, this is how this tool works to help you with that. So again, here's the option where you see the tile question and it's just simply a yes or no. So the more information, like I said, we give, what it does is it puts a gray box in over that and that's going to be when your cash crop is growing. And so as you look at those goals and then you look at what cash crop and then the, um, the drainage options, then we get that ranked order. Again, still, if there are two fours, as you can see in the winter cereal rye, that just means that it's in that alphabetical order of having fours. The other thing that I remind people is you can hover over, maybe you don't remember which goals you put in because sometimes the screen gets a little long or if you're using your phone, it does give you the option to move over and hover um, to say, okay, this, this is a four for erosion fighter and a four for soil builder. Again, it also has the start of the fly free date that will show in some of those species that we need to worry about that. So once you have selected a species, you can click on it in blue and it actually shows you more information. It will give you specifically seeding rates. It will give you seeding depth. It will talk about, do I want to drill this or am I going to aerial apply this? One thing that 
you need to realize with this tool selector is these seeding rates are based on how to establish this cover crop, not necessarily a program requirement for seeding. And so one of the things that I will share is there will be another update coming in calendar year 2021 where we will add the species mixes back into this selector tool. So once I have that information, I can print those, do my homework, talk with others, um, work with your local extension office, your soil and water, NRCS to say, what are the other things I need? If you wanna dig a little deeper, once you have those um, species, we have some other fact sheets available through Ohio State. Um, again, these are based on getting started. There's one called post corn going to soybeans using cereal rye. There's another one post soybeans going to corn using oats and radish. Again, these are located through ohioline.osu.edu. They are fact sheets ANR84 and ANR85. They're also located at the Midwest Cover Crops um, website. And then the last thing that I'll talk about is one of the other options is the Cover Crops Field Guide, the second edition. Those are purchased through the Purdue store for $5 each plus shipping. That's a great pocket guide to have with you just to look more at those species. It's got color pictures. We are currently updating that. So in calendar year 2022, you will see a new edition of that cover crops field guide. With that, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me in my office or via email. And I will turn this back over to Rachel. And we've got a poll here for the end. Um, just prior to this, have you ever used that Midwest Cover Crops tool selector? And do you have a copy of that SARE publication? All right, we're almost at 50, oh, we're at 50% voted. Let's see, give it a few more seconds, see if we can get that a little bit higher. And while we're finishing up this poll, let's go ahead and get Jason's presentation up. All right, there's the results for that poll. We got about, I think, 75% people voted. And we will include that at the end. Thank you. Go for it, Jason. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Hart, too, the Ag and Natural Resources Educator in Crawford County. And I'm going to be sharing with you some work we've been doing on using cover crops and some different um, literature reviews on how those cover crops can improve water quality um, and looking at some different cover crops we planted down at Farm Science Review this year and how those are degrading this winter, um, what we may be planting through in the spring and considerations, you know, for how they're still there to hold that soil in place, even as some of them are decaying. So you won't have that as much residue to plant through. You won't have to figure out how to kill them uh, next spring. So we all know that water is a very powerful force. You know, we're talking about how we can use cover crops to improve water quality. Um, water has a very powerful force and can move our soils a long way. Um, and sometimes our cover crops do an excellent job of holding that soil in place. And other times, even the best rooted root systems can't exactly hold that soil in place due to the force that water can have. As you look across those pictures, that road ditch, while well, there's a lot of riprap laying there that also had grass growing over top of that riprap originally and heavy rainfalls were able to move that soil um, create erosion as you look across those pictures it's all erosion caused by high moving water but if we have a strong growing cover crop uh, we can do a much better job of retaining that soil in place and preventing erosion if you look at that middle picture uh, those corn stalks definitely helped to catch a soil that was flowing across the landscape, but imagine if there'd been a growing crop on there to slow that water down even more and help hold that soil in place and catch even more of the erosion that was coming down the stream from the neighbor's farms. So what are some benefits to cover crops and water quality? Um, they definitely help with erosion control. So if cover crops can help stop soils from moving into the water and they have an average decrease in soil loss per acre 
when you compare a field that has an average cover crop on it to conventional tillage. Um, when we're talking conventional tillage, don't think like reduced tillage. Um, think conventional fall plowing, very loose soils. Um, those soils lose about 20.8 tons more soil per acre per year than if we had a cover crop present. If we go to a reduced tillage system, uh, maybe we're just going in the spring and running that vertical tillage tool. Uh, maybe we're just disking or field cultivating that field. By, keeping a, by having a cover crop on it, um, we actually reduce that soil loss by about six and a half tons per year. And even when you think about a no-till field, um, we think of no-till as that gold standard to reduce soil loss, and it does a really good job. Um, but it's not perfect. There's definitely still some soil loss. Even with cover crops, we can still have a small amount of soil loss, uh, just depending on how strong that water's moving. But on average, a cover crop's going to reduce a no-till system soil loss by 1.2 tons of soil per acre per year. So how does rain affect soil when we start thinking about it? You know, rain uh, may be cold and wet, and that's what you don't like about it. But sometimes you're out in a rainstorm, and it feels like those raindrops are just pelting you. Uh, when they're smacking your face, they almost hurt. A raindrop can range in size from about one to seven millimeters, and they can move pretty darn fast. When they strike the soil, um, they can be moving as fast as 20 miles per hour when they hit the ground. And you're trying to think, what's 20 miles per hour? Well, that's about as fast as the average tractor goes down the road, or maybe the tractor doesn't even move that fast. So while it may not be moving like a car, 20 miles an hour is still pretty good speed for a raindrop to impact the ground. When it hits that ground at 20 miles an hour, it then causes soil splash. Um, if that raindrop's not slowed down and it smashes into the ground at 20 miles an hour, the average amount of distance that it displaces soil is about three to five feet. So during one large downpouring rainstorm event, it may not cause erosion of soil moving off of an acre of land, but it actually will move about 90 tons of soil per acre during that downpour if those raindrops aren't slowed down and we don't decrease that soil splash. Uh, most of that soil splash then just fills in the soil pores, which then can create that hard crusting following a rain event that plants can't germinate through. Um, and then that the next rain event doesn't actually penetrate the soil and percolate down through and increase the water in our soil table that allows us to have water for our crops to grow. Often the most limiting factor across many of our landscapes in Ohio is it a nutrient? It's the amount of water our soils can hold and when we get that rainfall events so that our crops have enough water to grow. So the more water we can store in that soil profile, the more we can get to enter that soil profile, the higher the crop yield we have the potential to produce. When we look at rainfall effects on the soil, some things that we can do to decrease that soil splash is to have a crop canopy present. Um, a crop canopy on average decreases soil splash by about 67%. Uh, soil detachment under the canopy only averages about 4,000 pounds per acre. If we have a good canopy cover, 90 to 100% leaf that is slowing down those rain droplets, we can take 90 tons down to about 4,000 pounds per acre. So when you look at soil erosion rates, um, this is in kilograms, but as we look at this table and move across, you can see over here on the left, there is no cover present. And then you go over to the right, which is 100%. Uh, cover present on the ground. Really, you never reach 100%. Most of our crops, if we have a solid crop canopy that looks solid, we're really hanging out at 70 to 85, 90% canopy cover. Um, if we would, we take a picture with some different tools and try to see once how much soil we can see. A lot of times there's still a little bit of soil we can find in that area. But you really decrease that crop canopy or that soil splash by having a crop canopy present. Uh, you notice some different shapes on here. So soil erosion is also affected by the intensity. So how fast the rain is falling um, and the slower rainfall events, we have less soil splash when we're getting a two to three inch rain in an hour. Uh, that's when we see those greatest soil losses due to soil splash because those raindrops are big. They're coming down fast and displacing a lot of soil. So I kind of I wanted to share this video. A couple of my coworkers and I have worked on of some projects we have going on down at FSR. Um, it does a really nice job of showing how these cover crops are breaking down and what we still have present as crop canopy at this point. One, to slow down the snow melt. Um, all these cover crops right now are under snow. So when that melts, depending how fast it melts, you know, we'll have water moving and to see once how much canopy we have left to slow down those raindrops and decrease that soil splash.
Hi everybody, I'm Jason Hartshue. We're back down here at Farm Science Review today checking out some of the different cover crops we had planted. I'll give you guys an update on how they're breaking down this winter, um, see what's, what's going on. So behind me is the multiple cover crops all planted in a strip that we've shown you before. As you start going across them, first you have that forage turnip. It's still really green, uh, very surprising actually how much green is there, make a great forage crop still. And if you would happen to dig one out, which we did, you'll find that the bulbs are still very hard. They have not broke down at all. There's no squishiness to them. They're very firm yet. After those, um, we have some annual ryegrass, a spot here that we dug up, and you can really see some good root structure there. So not only do we have a good top that's gonna help break the rainfall, but we also have roots. So if we had that downpour rain, those roots are gonna help hold your soil in place. And as you go across, our uh, winter annuals that are going to overwinter as we go across those. Most of them have a really good root mass. The hairy vetch has really good ground cover, has some nice fine fibrous root system. It's going to help hold that soil in place again. When you get over to the radishes, the radishes have a little bit of top growth left on them that isn't totally dead, but they're getting really squishy. You can pick them up and basically squeeze them just like it was a soft sponge if you wanted to, and they're just going to break really easy if we hit them with our shovel. Uh, when we move over to the other turnip, it's still very firm. It doesn't have much growth on the top anymore, so it's not going to do a good job of breaking that rainfall if it's planted alone, and it also doesn't have much of a root system beyond the bulb. So that probably needs something else planted with it to help hold your soil in place. And that turnip bulb, though, is still very firm and solid. Uh, the sorghum, um, it's pretty well dead. It's a little taller, not breaking down very quickly, standing up. It's going to help catch that snow that might be blowing through. There's peas on the other side of that. The peas have created a good ground cover, uh, help break the rain, have some good root system. And then you move over to the oats on the far side. The oats is dead, um, but we still have some really good top growth that's present, hasn't broken down yet. That's going to slow those hard raindrops down so they don't erode your soil. And when we dug it up, we actually found that there's still some good roots that are sticking together well to help hold our soil in place even though that crop is dead and it's going to be really interesting to see in the spring how much of that oats is broken down to be able to plant through some of these crops it looks like we're going to have a lot of top growth to try to deal with this spring hi i'm amanda doritas osu extension educator from champaign county and i'm back out here in front of one of the mixes we have um, so you can really see the brassicas are still green That's the tall um, sticks we have. That's completely dead along with the sunflowers. But we still have nice cover from that brassica. All right, we're back out here at the interseed cover crops. If you've been following us through the season, we had some challenges with these interseeded cover crops that are planted into the growing corn crop at about V5. Uh, it didn't look like we had a crop success. At, at first, it looked like nothing grew. And then later on, it looked like the only thing we had was a few radishes and a little bit of red clover. Now, as we look down across these, um, you can see the radishes are filling in those corn rows nice helping out where we didn't have a lot of corn fodder to protect that soil. They're not as dead as the big radishes. The frost really hasn't got them yet. You look across the clovers, they had a couple clovers out here, the red clover and the crimson clover. Both have some decent growth on them. It's gonna make it through the winter more than likely. And the annual rye and cereal rye, both of those have a little bit of growth. The cereal rye is not quite as good as the annual rye grass. But at the end of the day, uh, we had multiple species grow in our inner seed. It looks like it could be a successful practice. So let's talk a little bit about the weather that we've seen since our first video recording out here. Um, November, right after we recorded that video, within a day or two, we hit a low of 27 degrees Fahrenheit, which was probably what we'd consider the first hard frost. From November through the end of the year, most of the days hovered around the 32 degree mark, with only five days not getting above that. Then January turned much colder and we had only three days with lows above 32 degrees. And about half of that time, the average temperature stayed below freezing. So we got a lot of work going on down at Farm Science Review in the Ag Crops Demonstration Area. And then there's other research plots around the state uh, looking at different cover crops, how we can manage them uh, to assist farmers. 
And often we believe that in order to control erosion, we have to have that green cover crop throughout the entire year. Um, while that is ideal, it's also very helpful, basically any cover crop out there that can slow rain impact and just slow water down as it's moving across the ground. As long as that crop, even after it dies, it still has roots in the soil and until those detach, it's gonna help slow the water and decrease the erosion and nutrient losses and contamination of the water with sediment. Uh, when you look at this picture, we took a waterway and we planted on one side, I guess I shouldn't call it a waterway because a waterway really should be a grass waterway that where water runs um, very often. This is more like an area that was often a wash um, in that swale, took and planted right down the middle, radishes on one side in the fall and then just left the other side with no cover. And as you can see those radishes, they actually helped to hold the soil in place during some heavy rainfall events into the spring, even after those radishes had died off. Over on the no cover side, we see that golly, um, which can happen in really large rainfall events, even if we do have a growing crop. But definitely when you compare these two, even though the radish winter killed, uh, it'd be very easy for us to plant through the following year. It helped hold that soil in place through some tough summer rainfall events in the spring. So when we look at cover crops um, and how they can help prevent other things besides just soil erosion, one thing to really look at is nitrate leaching. So cover crops have that ability and we'll look at some different cover crops here in a couple more slides and how much nutrients they are holding in their biomass. Uh, but cover crops have the ability to mine nutrients out of the soil and hold them in that green biomass uh, so they can't leave. And the big one is nitrates. We can hold nitrates in that cover crop and decrease the amount of nitrate that leaves through the soil. So as you can see on this slide, the gray line is the amount of cumulative precipitation and then the red line is the nitrates leaching from the field where there's no crop planted or no cover crop growing. And basically during every rainfall event, you see nitrate leaving that farm. Uh, the more rain you get, the more nitrates that leave. But down here with the wheat, the rye and the barley, during germination when that crop was small, they did a good job of taking up nitrates. We had a couple really large rainfall events, especially this one right here around 90, to 100 days where there was a large rainfall event and there was some nitrate leaching. Um, comparing those crops, it looks like there's a little bit of a difference in how much nitrate they held, uh, but basically they held that same amount of nitrate and really changed the amount of nitrates leaving the farm. Uh, on this scale, basically the cover crop kept it at about a one, which is grams of nitrate per meter squared compared to no cover crop at all where it's up around eight grams of nitrates. And during this study, you can see there's not a lot of rainfall. So it's 500 millimeters, uh, so 50 centimeters of rainfall. And if we go to year three of this study that was published, um, you can see they had a lot more rain. So they had about 700 millimeters of rain in this section of the study. But you see those same trends where there's a lot more nitrate leaving without a cover crop planted. And when the cover crop is present, which is your blue, green, and orange line again, of course, as that crop is small, if we have a lot of rain during the establishment period, it can only hold so much nitrate in its plant tissue. Uh, so there's some large rainfall events there before 90, 60 days. You know, you think about these are all winter annuals planted in the fall. You don't have a lot of growth. Um, those plants, they are holding some nitrates back. We start to really see that divergence though around 90 days where the plants are big enough, they're really holding that nitrate in and the soils are losing a lot more nitrate when there isn't a cover crop present. So that's one major advantage. So anytime we're following a corn crop or a soybean crop, and we're trying to hold the nitrogen that that crop didn't use in our soil profile, uh, by planting a cover crop, we can utilize that nitrogen in the cover crop and possibly hold it in, this, in our cover crop and then release it for our future agronomic crop. Um, when we look at cover crop effects on water quality, comparing just utilizing crop residue to a cover crop. Um, so these are paired treatments and they're looking at the runoff and the rainfall events. There isn't as much rainfall down here when they put on the cover crop, uh, but you can see residue prevents runoff. Residue somewhat prevents sediment. Residue doesn't really do anything over here when we look at phosphorus. So when we look at phosphorus, residue doesn't change DRP leaving and it doesn't really change um, total phosphorus a lot. There is a couple slight sites in this literature review where there was a downward where it did, but the majority of the time you didn't see a change in phosphorus. 
cover crops though, you notice over here on total runoff. So it's just residue, you don't see an A or a B. So they didn't actually significantly reduce runoff with just crop residue. But by having a cover crop, <clears throat> this large literature review found a significant reduction in cover crop being present through reducing the amount of runoff coming from the farm. Now they didn't have a significant reduction in sediment, but again, it was a significant downward trend. Um, there was a downward trend across most sites in DRP or no change at all in DRP loss. And then total phosphorus um, had a downward trend across most sites, uh, but it wasn't significant because at a few sites in this literature review, there was an increase in total phosphorus. But the majority of the time, cover crops do decrease total phosphorus uh, because they're holding that sediment on the farm and decreasing soil erosion. Uh, that same study, diving in a little bit more to cover crops effect on just DRP, looking at surface runoff, um, compared and subsurface drainage. So when you look at water extractable, there's a lot of phosphorus being held in the cover crop, uh, but unfortunately there wasn't really a change in phosphorus leaving in that surface runoff or the subsurface drainage but we are definitely holding phosphorus in those cover crops. So there's less potential for it to be lost. So to look at some different crops and how much phosphorus, nitrogen and potassium they're holding in that plant biomass. Um, we have some forage studies that we're looking at how much nutrients are retained in that crop. And when you think about forage, um, you know, if we're retaining it in the forage, we're also retaining it in our cover crop biomass. So our grass species, if we let them grow to that 10.5 growth stage, which is head emergence, a little later than I would really like to see them killed if we're gonna plant a corn crop. Probably okay if we're going in with a soybean crop. Now these are really dense stands. If you look here in the picture, that's probably 95% crop cover there on the soil because we're planting for forage yields. Uh, so then we start looking here at how much are we retaining? So it peaks 10.0, so that's when that head is just emerging. Um, if we looked at a carbon and nitrogen ratio on rye, at that point, it's going to be like 40 to 1. Um, it's going to be tying up some nitrogen from our soil when it decomposes, but nowhere near as much if it grows to 10.5. But how much nutrients are we retaining in the biomass? So these are about one ton yield at 10.0 and about a ton and a half to two ton yield at 10.5. <clears throat> nitrogen in that crop, we're retaining about 35 pounds of nitrogen per acre of the 40 that we put on in the spring. So we actually didn't uptake quite all the nitrogen we applied didn't really mine any out um, in the biomass we removed. We, uh, then when we look at 10.5, a lot of these we took up about all 50 pounds of nitrogen we applied, may have mined a little bit out of the soil too on a few of these crops. Then we look at phosphorus, you know, how much phosphorus are we holding in that crop? Um, 10.0, that beaks had just emerged and we have five to 10 pounds of P2O5 per acre retained in the crop. And at about feeks 10, we have 10, about 10 pounds retained in that crop. It hasn't really produced its grain head yet. and It'll put a lot of phosphorus into that grain. So we're not retaining as much P2O5 in the biomass, but we're holding some there that we wouldn't have potential then to lose uh, through leaching or erosion. When we look at potassium, uh, we're definitely holding some potassium also, about 30, 35 pounds at 10.0 and about 40 pounds at 10.5. Then wondering, you know, what is summer annuals hold? So if we're playing that grass crop after we harvest wheat, <clears throat> how much nutrients can we retain? Um, in this study, we actually applied 100 pounds of nitrogen because again, we are going for forage yield in this study. So we weren't trying to mine the nitrogen out of the soil. Um, but in a second, when I show some oat studies, it may actually be beneficial to, to even improve soil mining if we apply a little nitrogen. But when we look here, we're holding about 50 pounds from the sorghum. The oats was holding 118 pounds. Soybeans had 75 pounds in their biomass. But we're also holding a lot more phosphorus in these summer annuals. Um, and we're still only looking at one to two ton yield uh, coming off of these. Most of them were close to that two ton. But we're holding about 30 pounds of P2O5 in the biomass of that crop. You know, that crop's gonna uptake it. We still had wheat residue present. So all that residue then is helping to hold that phosphorus on our farm that could be have potential to be lost if it's not utilized by the crop. Um, when you look at potassium, these summer annuals take up a lot of potassium. So they were holding 180, 200 pounds, some of them. Others were down around 70 pounds. They're definitely holding a lot of potassium on the farm. 
And when we move into looking at an oats crop, so this crop was planted in mid-September. So we had, a, you had an early soybean harvest, you could go in with oats. Um, as you go back to that farm science review video, you saw that the oats died off very nicely. They still had a very nice mat that they would help protect the soil, hold it in place, had a strong root system. But how much nutrients are the oats holding in place on the farm? If we don't apply any nitrogen, one challenge is we do, basically don't get crop growth on these oats. So the oats only had about three quarter ton yield. Um, if that meets your goals, that's fine. Uh, and it's only retaining about seven pounds of nitrogen per acre. All that would have been nitrogen that was mined out of the soil. When you look at phosphorus as P2O5, it's holding about four pounds and 15 pounds of K2O. And when we applied 50 pounds of nitrogen, we were whole, retained about 30 pounds of that in the crop, 14 pounds of P2O5 and 63 pounds of potassium. With this late planting date, we really needed this crop to take off and grow though, if we were gonna produce biomass and ground cover um, and retain a lot of nutrients. So with 100 pounds of nitrogen applied, we actually retained 111 pounds of nitrogen. So we mined some of that out of the soil, uh, 46 pounds of P2O5 and 229 pounds of K2O. Um, so we're definitely retaining a lot of nutrients in that biomass that's uptaking it. And then as it breaks down, it's gonna be released. Um, some other options here I'm going to move through quickly for, you know, planting a cover crop. I showed that interseeded crop down at Farm Science Review. If you're no-tilling into a corn crop, you have a really good root system where the corn plant was, but between the rows, uh, you don't have as good of erosion control. So planting a cover crop, may possibly utilizing interseeding can work well. Um, these are just some various pictures of that interseed that was planted with a row cultivator. Um, you have a nice crop here growing down at Farm Science Review on your bottom left, actually planted with a drill into the growing corn crop right there between the rows. Um, you can see in that top picture that was planted with the row cultivator, a nice cover, cr of cover crop of clover coming on or some radishes that grew really nice in a cornfield where there was a bare spot of no corn growth. Um, so it held off the weeds. And then it also protected the soil by having that top growth present during heavy rainfall events. Cover crops can fit in many systems. A lot of times we think about cover crops only for the no-till systems. But you know, when we think about holding the soil in place, they can have a lot of advantages to work into a tillage system. Here's a guy that's full tillage. That's how he utilizes his cover crop. He plants it in the fall, chisel plows in the spring. That's part of his termination method. He actually harvested that crop as a forage crop also. Um, and we'll plant into that and does a very good job of protecting his soils, but tillage is his system and it works well. Uh, here's another, some more pictures from him where he's, can chisel plow sometimes in the fall and we'll spread a cover crop during that chisel plow event. That cover crop grows, helps to hold the soil in place, goes out really early and cultivates it when the rye is still small or whatever cover crop he's using that year. Um, and that actually kills most of it, then comes back and sprays it, makes him a nice seed bed. No, it's not a no-till system, but he's using those cover crops to protect the soil, help hold it in place and retain some nutrients and it works well in his system. So cover crops, uh, they're great for protecting water, feeding cows and growing farms for generations to come by protecting soils. But it's really important to remember that there isn't really one method to cover cropping that's right for everybody. The real goal is covering the soil to protect the water and then figuring out how we can make that work in our system and not believing it's one size fits all. Um, we're gonna save all the questions for the end so that Les has some time here and I'll let him share his screen. How are we doing? All right, Les, I've got your introduction slide up right now. Um, so go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, okay. Um, Les Seiler up here in Northwest Ohio, Fulton County. Um, we've been um, continuous no-till since 1986. Uh, probably a couple miles of waterways, uh, some filter strips, uh, uh, flatter ground to, I suppose, uh, six to 12 degrees in some of the areas up here. Um, just rolling, a little bit rolling terrain that uh, uh, makes the waterways a real necessity. But I wanted to talk a little bit about how do we 
how do we get a return on investment if we're just going to do a cover crop for a short period of time and how it might be a, a positive effect for water quality. And uh, we invest this money in cover crops. Maybe we're doing it on a rented farm and we, we question what's going to happen here. What's our return on it going to be? But uh, it, even if you take a soybean crop off or a corn crop and you get a cereal rye um, cover crop started and it actually shows that it's emerged, I feel like that's a plus. You've already got something out of that because it's going to make a difference on your wind and water erosion no matter what versus just nothing growing out there. Plus you've started, you've continued that living root system in the soil. And, and that's a big positive if you're trying to work towards a soil health system. Um, eventually we, you know, we see a lot of benefits of soil health because of what we're doing and keeping a living root growing longer than the five or six months or whatever we got for a corn and soybean um, crop rotation. But uh, getting getting something growing out there and, and letting it grow through the winter, if it's just emerged, I think you're getting a return on it already. Um, another quick return is to consider uh, growing growing your uh, cover crop, maybe to help control some problem weeds, mare's tail. That's an issue that we all have to deal with up here. And uh, a good a good uh, drilled cover crop is an advantage for that. Um, on some of this stuff, we do a lot of interseeding. We like to interseed with an airplane sometime after Labor Day, our corn acres, and we use a high boy seeder on our soybean acres because we've already got the tram lines in to match up our sprayer, so it's not a big deal. And I, I would say if your system's a little more mature, your success is going to be better with that type of uh, sprinkle seeding method. Um, another thing that's really important with that is what did you use for your herbicides? Um, the, the, more, the more you get into these systems and see them more mature, your organic matter is going to be better. You're probably going to help digest some of these residual herbicides a little bit better too. Um, versus if you're just getting started. And uh, on soybeans, I think it's, it all depends on what type of fall we get. But like this year, we planted, we uh, harvested soybeans, a 3-0 bean up here, and I drew, we had uh, the drill running pretty quick. And we got a tremendous stand of cereal rye on a farm. It's, it's uh, prone to backwater flooding. And my hope there is that we'll be able to if we do get flooded, retain some of the residue where the combine left it instead of it all getting floated into windrows or um, different areas of the farm because the, as a cover crop grows through it, it'll kind of lace it down and help hold it. I think that's, a, that's another good water quality thing that uh, if we can keep it on the land, maybe we'll keep it out of the ditches. <laughs> um, we, we, uh, we see a lot of stuff blowed around. I mean, we all see a lot of uh, snow in the ditches and uh, in the neighborhood that's uh, got soils in it. Uh, that's really good soil. It's blowing around throughout the winter months. So I'd like to keep that on the land if we could. Um, one, another one we've seen on on one of our farms is uh, growing uh, cereal rye that we uh, interseeded after Labor Day. We had a farm that was pretty high in cyst nematode numbers in over a three year period, I think, or six years. We'd sampled that and we was able to drop those numbers on this farm just because of the, the uh, cereal rye I think we had some radish in it too but as you get later in the season you kind of got to throw out the the blends like the radish and you're kind of committed to more of the the cool season stuff like the cereal rye but it it's a it's very hardy in the cool seasons 
Um, it's always a good idea to start small with some of this stuff, figure out what your goals are and what your, uh, what you want to end up with when you get done. I mean, uh, we're trying to end up with, uh, the water that runs down our waterways being pretty clean versus muddy, um, keeping the soil on the land, um, uh, the, the living, the living roots are, are working and feeding our microbes and building up our, our soil biology, which it, uh, it's been a positive, real positive thing that we've seen over the, over the time. But again, that's a more time, it takes more time to get there. I just want to say, I think you can get some cover crops out there and get a pretty quick return on them. If you, if you think about it, if you, if you've uh, got land, that's prone to water or wind erosion and uh, um, that's why we're doing what we're doing. And a good healthy soil will hold and retain and recycle nutrients too. I mean, the, the biological thing with the cover on the top and a, and a good tall cereal rye crop that you may have rolled down or wondered what was going to happen. Um, it's, always, it's always amazed me how at harvest time, if we have some beneficial rains through the summer, that, that cover crop is consumed. I mean, it didn't blow away or nothing. It, it just got consumed. So there, there's a lot of cool stuff with uh, a good, healthy soil. And uh, cover crops can sure help uh, do, do that, plus keep our water cleaner too. So I guess that's kind of quick. I don't know. Uh, another one, I guess, livestock guys. There might be some other opportunities for livestock guys just, just from a manure standpoint if you got a good cover out there, a living cover. And uh, an easy one, another easy one is to have some wheat. Um, I know a lot of people don't like to fool with wheat, but wheat gives you an opportunity to do a lot of, a lot of uh, beneficial cover crop work. And it's, it's always a positive for water quality when you can see the, the clearer water coming off the something that's got really good cover on it versus the muddy water. So I guess I'm ready for questions if anybody's got any, Rachel. All right, thank you, Les. Um, and I wanna thank all of our speakers for today. Um, we're gonna get into Q and A's here in a minute, but first I just wanted to remind everyone that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on our um, YouTube channel and uh, it'll be emailed out to everybody um, once we get it posted. So um, I wanna invite all of our speakers back for this Q&A. Um, and the first question that we got is, have there been problems with cereal rye with root systems uh, plugging drainage tile? And if so, what are some of the solutions? Okay, Rachel, um, I'll, I'll talk about the whole tile and cover crops and especially cereal rye. I think since probably 2016, we've, start to, we've started to hear this question come up. And I think there are a lot of different factors. Um, the research backing that, there is a small research project, but definitely the need for more. And when you're doing tile, type research and cover crop, time is probably critical. And so um, Larry Brown from Ohio State, um, Eileen Cladovico from Purdue, and Barry Fisher from Indiana NRCS um, had conducted some of this research. And some of their findings that they, they talked about was, number one, there wasn't enough research to say one year versus another. But I think things to think about, um, was it actually the cover crop um, clogging the tile? Or did they actually look at, you know, what is that? Is it a combination of cover crops? Um, I think sometimes you need to look at the weather and what has happened. You know, has the year been extremely wet or extremely dry where maybe that water that is possibly held in that tile system could be affecting that? And so um, as we look at that or a little more in depth, looking through that tile system, and in the end, I'll actually post some of their research results the setting that tile up and having that correct 
actually installed is sometimes important to grade. Um, especially, I guess, it's harder when you're in this the flatter Northwest Ohio, I think, to see some of those issues. But looking at, you know, was there a low spot that that's where that's clogging that tile? Um, are you using, you know, um, correct couplers when you're installing that tile? The other thing is to look at, you know, how old is the tile? One of the things through Eileen Cladovico's research is um, in that very first year after installing tile, not to plant um, cover crops directly over that tile line because that soil is so loose um, because of the installation that it sometimes affects that. And I think the second part of that are, what are some of the solutions that we can look at? And so again, the research, we need a little more, but um, what, what can you do? Um, looking again, like I said, the types of couplers, what cover crops did you plant um, if it was, or what cash crop other than that cereal rye in previous years that maybe changed that soil. Um, if you did figure out that yes, it was the cover crop for sure, cereal rye, um, looking at alternating the type of cover crop with a shallow rooting versus a deep rooting cover actually helps with that problem. Um, sometimes termination timing is key to look at, you know, whether that tile is being plugged by those or not. And so terminating those cover crops a little bit earlier in the spring has a less chance to actually plug those tile lines. Um, also alternating your winter kill covers um, with those that overwinter. And again, just remembering those new drainage systems. There's a lot of other things, but again, we'll, we'll start with that one. Um, and if that person has more questions, feel free to email me, but I will share some of those research results. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Um, we're going to move on to this next question, which I think either Les or one of our other speakers can answer. Um, are there cover crop species or planting scenarios that can mine phosphorus for fields with high soil phosphorus concentrations? So I'll take at least part of that if Les wants to chime in. When you say mine phosphorus, a couple of things when you and high soil phosphorus concentrations. If you're talking about mining phosphorus to try to draw down those levels in the field, the only way we can truly mine it and draw it down is to remove it. So there are some cover crops that work very well uh, to mine phosphorus in the terms of making it more available for our cash crops to use. Um, one of those crops that mines or takes up a lot of phosphorus is um, buckwheat. Um, it'll take up a lot of phosphorus and it'll hold it, but buckwheat has a very short life. But if you're looking at mining phosphorus and actually removing it from your farm, um, you know, a cover crop is going to pull it up, hold it in its biomass, but it's not going to mine it and remove it to lower soil test levels. Um, really high yielding forage crops are the best answer. If you're looking at removing phosphorus from the farm on those high levels, you remove a lot of phosphorus with a really well managed alfalfa crop. Um, and some of our other forage crops are removing a lot more phosphorus than what we do with a cash grain crop. But if you're looking at tying it up, um, there are a lot of crops that can do that. Your summer crops are going to tie up more phosphorus than an overwintering crop until that overwintering crop takes off and grows. So kind of, I guess, part of that is what is your goals with that question of what you're looking to do? Thanks, Jason. Um, Les, do you have anything you want to add to I that? Was I was going to add the buckwheat thing on there if you're trying to access it, but it sounds like maybe there's a lot there and they're trying to grow it out. Um, just keep something growing on it. I mean, it's better than no matter what, it's going to be better for water quality if you've got a grass cover on it or something that can overwinter just to keep something living on it. And um, I want to make a comment too on drainage tile. We've had a lot of problems with drainage tile, never one because of cereal rye. It's always been wheat. Wheat's a crop that's out there for eight or nine months. And every time we've had a problem, it had to do with a sag, a connection, or something that we've actually had a mishap when the, when the system was put in. And, and that's just, uh, it's frustrating even if it's a new system, but they, there is some issue, issues with that. Some of the T-taps 
will slow it down, but it's never been cereal rye. It's always been wheat. And I think it's because the wheat's out there eight to nine months out of the year, longer than any other crop we have other than alfalfa. So, thoughts? All right. Um, our next question is, what's the termination method you recommend to minimize the risk of soil and nutrient loss in the spring as cash crop planting and establishment is going on? Um, I'll hit that quick. We got, we just invested in a crimper roller. I don't know how it's going to work because we bought it last year and didn't need it um, because we got planted early enough. So we used uh, herbicides, glyphosate, 2,4-D, cleaned everything up that way. Yeah. As Les says, basically, if you're looking to Minimize the risk of soil loss and nutrient loss in the spring as you're planting that cash crop. Um, your first option is going to be herbicide and then followed by roller crimpers. And <clears throat> a lot of that, you know, the success of a roller crimper depends on the size of the crop when you crimp it. So depending on time of year, if that's the option you want to go with, um, the roller crimper is a little bit later in that growth stage where herbicides, if we can get planted early, uh, used at the right rates, can work quite well. Um, some things to keep in mind for herbicides. You know, a lot of us like to use 10 to 15 gallons for burn down and like to scoot on that 10 gallon side for our carrier, just because we're carrying less water to the field. If we're trying to really kill the crop and if we're in that 15 to 20 stage, we're gonna do a much better job. Some of these cover crops are very actively growing in the spring. We want that active growth, but we also need a higher herbicide rate in order to kill them. So making sure we're using that labeled rate and looking for warm days. Um, I don't have that quickly available, but the warmer the weather, the more active the herbicide is. Um, if we can spray when we're averaging over 50 degrees for the day, ideally nighttime temperatures aren't falling below that 50, but at least averaging 50 degrees for the day, we're gonna have that active growth in the cover crop to kill it. And then what cover are you trying to kill? Um, you know, if you got clovers out there, I have a few guys that struggle with high clover growth, you need to add in some 2,4-D or dicamba into that mix and not just be trying to kill it with a glyphosate product. And uh, Liberty, Gramoxone, they'll burn the top off, but if we have a strong root system, they may not actually kill the cover crop for you. All right, um, if no one else has anything to add to that, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, which is, what is the first benefit that you saw after implementing cover crops on your fields? I guess I'll, I'll say something quick. I just think uh, water quality. I mean, uh, cleaner water, the water going, when we did get to heavy events, the water going off the into the waterways or whatever was clearer versus mud. I, I think that was that was a huge benefit that, that we've seen. Yeah, I guess I would echo less there that the big benefit that is visual and that you see very quickly is soil retention and cleaner waters leaving the farm through the surface. Uh, you may not see cleaner tile water right away. Uh, it just depends. Sometimes even coming off a cover crop field, you can have murky tile water. Um, but a lot of times even tile water clears up, but that surface water and the soil retention, less swales, less washes across the farm are the things you see very quickly after adding a cover crop in. Awesome. Um, the next question, what is one piece of advice you have for farmers that are considering implementing cover crops but haven't yet? I think all of us have said to start small <laughs> and uh, work your way up and, and kind of figure out what you're really trying to do here with the goal, like Sarah um, explained in her presentation. I mean, you got to have a goal on what you're really trying to do. And uh, I think that's start small. I agree with Les, just starting small is key. And just 
saying, um, what am I trying to do here and doing my homework because you probably have experience raising your cash crops for multiple years. And sometimes when you look at that cover crop side, um, it's, it's difficult to know A, where to start and B, what do I do? But there are things you need to think about as you start small, you know, termination, timing. Can I manage this within my farm operation? You know, how many people do I have available or is it something that, you know, it's going to be just me. And so I think those are all questions that you need to answer as you begin. And, and again, starting small is key though. Okay. Um, our next two questions are kind of related, so I'm going to give them to you at the same time. Um, so the first one is, Sarah mentioned that cover crops will not fix drainage. Relatedly, are cover crops going to help our fields dry quicker or more slowly? And the next question is um, asking about the water holding capacity um, of using cover crops and how it benefits the cash crop. Um, water holding capacity on, on a system is going to be a whole lot better. It, uh, if you can store more water, it'll sure uh, be your best friend in July. I mean, water's, water's our best friend at times, and it's our worst enemy at times. And, and uh, if we can store it up to, to the July period like we did last year, it was sure a benefit to us. Uh, we had an awfully, awfully dry, hot July uh, 30 some days and 90 degrees plus. And I thought our corn crop was really bad shape. And uh, we get, ended up getting a nice rain August 14th. And it, uh, I'd never seen a, a crop get refreshed so quick as how that did ours. It actually refreshed it. Uh, we had great yields, good yields, and uh, it delayed. I don't know whether it went stagnant, dormant, whatever happened, but it it came back to life and, and uh, produced quite well. And, and it was because we was able to store that water. We didn't we didn't let it run off, and uh, we uh, put it to good use. I think one of the things to think about um, with that question is what species am I using, um, and then you know, what, what have been the weather conditions. And I think when you're in that area of production agriculture, I think people start to look like, oh, am I the first person out there? And I think sometimes throwing the calendar out and looking at your soil temperatures, looking at um, what, what cash crop am I planting there, sometimes affects that, that water, um, you know, and like, like Les said, they, those crops can be sometimes your best friend or your worst enemy. Um, when you think about timing and getting in there, you know, what you're planting. And I think sometimes you just have to be patient. And I think that's, you know, if you get out there when that soil is too wet, you make more of a mess and then you'll never ever want to try those cover crops again sometimes. And so just talking, doing your homework, um, finding those, those silver linings um, with those people who have maybe experienced some of those different scenarios and talking through what can I do. So I think that's key. Another thing on that question, you know, do cover crops make your soil wetter or drier? Um, they do take up some moisture, so they will help pull some moisture out of the soil. But at the same time, sometimes in the spring, we're counting on um, the solar sunshine radiation to dry out the top couple inches so we can get in there and plant and our subsoils are still fairly damp. And then seeding rate greatly affects how much cover that cover crop provides to the soil. The higher the seeding rate, uh, the more shade that cover crop is going to provide. So a little bit damper that soil is going to be if the thing we're counting on is that solar sunshine to dry out the top little bit of the soil so we can get in there and plant. So there it is going to delay planting a little bit possibly. Um, but then again, as Sarah said, you may be planting into a better window because it was delayed and you weren't in there planting when the top two inches were dry enough and at inch three, it was still mud. Um, so it decreases potential for soil compaction and planting when the top looks dry and actually you're putting the seed into the mud. So there are some things there, um, but at the same time, a small amount of cover crop, when you think about that growing plant, we don't see standing water as often when we have growth in a field as we do when that field has nothing growing on it and those pores seal over. You go back to those large rainfall events that create rain splash, 
that basically plug up the soil pores so the water can't infiltrate. If we have a crop growing there, it helps keep those pores open because those roots are going down through. So then we can, can get the water to infiltrate and get those mud puddles where we have standing water to dry off so the field will dry so that we can plant it. So it's kind of a mixed bag as to, I guess, what cover crops do to either improve the speed that soil dries off or slow it down. I want to comment again on the, the sunlight. I mean, we're harvesting the sunlight. That's that's our uh, big friend there. But we need we need uh, the living roots in the ground. And, and when when we're harvesting the sunlight with the living crop on it, we're cycling. We're changing that soil temperature too because if that cover crop's growing, that soil temperature is warmer. It's it's sometimes warmer than what you think. I think back of the days when we was just straight no-till, we had issues with the colder, wetter soils. And since we've been uh, planting green and uh, planting into living covers, I know they're warmer now. And, and, and back to what Sarah said, you got to have a minimum soil temperature to, to go out there. It's a whole lot easier to have a, a great crop if you get your corn up in uh, seven days versus two or three weeks of being in the refrigerator. All right, you get a whole lot less temperature variation. You know, when you're counting on the sun to warm the soil, it may vary 10, 15 degrees or more. I mean, if we get a large cold spell, we can drop soils quickly below 50 degrees after we plant the crop. But when that growing cover crop is there, it also insulates the soil and you don't get that drop. So your seed doesn't get cold and it emerges and grows. Um, so there are a lot of benefits there to that shade and living roots. You know, you have to look at the whole picture, not just how fast is the field going to dry off so I can get in and plant. Great discussion there. Um, in keeping with that, uh, we got another question in the Q&A about waterways acting like uh, toilets that flush nutrients during a heavy rain. So is there anything that's being done in conjunction with cover crops with waterway design to maximize the impact to water quality? Try to slow, get your land so it's more like a sponge so you don't have as much running down the waterway. But uh, a lot of times that's out of your control. So um, some of the species of grasses uh, that are getting planted in different areas are supposed to have different benefits on, on the uptake of nutrients. Um, careful when we apply nutrients. Um, the, four R, the four R's, I guess, is what we really got to keep in mind. If we can get it in the ground, it's always going to be better. Uh, fertility on our corn planters, I think, is a, a big deal. Um, there is some work out there, I guess, on the waterways and saturated buffers, looking at actually utilizing those as a forage source, because if you harvest them as a forage, you're removing that nutrients that those crops uptook from that waterway to make it last longer, because at some point, some of those saturated buffers and waterways are becoming saturated to the point where they can't hold a whole lot more nutrients. Um, a lot of times you do see waterways though that are working well that fill in over time and have to be cleaned back out because those waterways are trapping sediment. Um, so those projects looking at utilizing waterways and those saturated buffers for forage are definitely a way to remove some of those nutrients. Um, one of the challenges there is a lot of waterways and saturated buffers have other conservation goals such as wildlife habitat. So you have to balance being able to use them as a forage and when wildlife are nesting and are really living in there because a lot of times by the time nesting is over in those areas, um, the forage quality is very low to utilize for any of our livestock. Okay, and one more question about water. Uh, what is our best way to assess our water holding capacity and any changes that we see over time? I think as we watch our tile outlets slow down, 
Um, we've got some that haven't run up here in our area um, since last August. We were extremely dry. And I know we've got some that haven't have not run water since then. Um, as you as you get into these systems that get a little bit more mature and, and the sponge is bigger, you'll see less gullying, uh, less runoff. Um, it, it's, it's just it's a time it takes time for that and, and that's where the the whole thing if you can if you have the ability to to get a more mature system you'll see a lot better results of it and and it's the water quality is going to be a whole lot better too Okay, um, moving on to a new topic. Um, if you plant cereal rye into bean stubble ahead of corn, um, have you ever had trouble with corn stand or stunted corn? And what planting rate of the rye would you have used? Um, I have seen it most of the time where I've seen it, it's I mean, it could have been higher seeding rates. I work with a lot of producers that harvest rye as forage. So they're planting into two and a half bushel rye, but they don't have the top growth there anymore. And they're very successful. But I have seen some times when rye's planted with a green bridge or the rye got really big and they killed the, killed the rye and then planted the corn where there has been stunting um, challenges. If you're looking to overcome those, uh, a lot of times, you know, uh, I think Les mentioned that nutrients on the planter. So if we're planting into these cover crops, and especially in that no-till system, um, you start finding more advantages to putting some nutrients on the planter, putting nitrogen, especially on the planter. Uh, if we're playing into a little bit cooler soils, potentially putting some phosphorus on the planter, and then really helps to overcome those challenges of that cover crop dying, starting to break down and having nutrients available for our crop to grow just making sure there's a lot going on with that planting you know stunted is one thing a lot of times that's nutrient challenges um, if you have missing spots that could be planter issues where we didn't get the seed trench closed and things just because our planter wasn't quite set up yet for the type of system we're trying to plant into i also think on that question too that the seeding rate um, looking at that, and Jason mentioned that, the heavier seeding rate um, going into that corn sometimes, you know, especially with that cereal rye, um, will affect that. And so maybe a less seeding rate um, with that, that cereal rye will tiller. And I think, you know, you're your best researcher sometimes. If you are out there seeding that cover crop, do a strip where it's, you know, a half rate of what you were putting on and see what happens. And I think that is one of the things that you'll be surprised at how well that, that cereal rye still establishes in tillers. The other big one, as Sarah mentioned, you know, seeding rates and tillering is making sure you get your seeding depth right. So if you go from an uncovered field and you're planting at inch and three quarters to two inch and you go into a field where you had a bushel and a half to two bushels of cereal rye, you have plant cover there that are gonna cause those wheels to ride up. Um, in these forage fields, when I'm working with growers there, are a lot of times that stubble's about two, three inches tall. And even when it's compressed, you're still adding about an inch to an inch and a half under those gauge wheels sometimes. And we really have to set the planter deeper to get the corn in where we need it. Uh, if we still want it in at that inch and three quarter to two inch range, at least an inch and a half uh, to get good germination and growth of that corn crop. Okay. Thank you all. Um, does interseeding the cover crop into the corn row affect the yield of the corn at all by taking nutrients or moisture from the corn? It could, um, but it all depends. So like Les talked about interseeding late with the airplane and high boy. At that stage, um, there's very little concern. Uh, interseeding, like I showed at Farm Science Review at that V4 to V5 stage, um, you would feel like it could, but the corn is established enough at that point and it's almost ready to shade out that usually the biggest challenge we have in high producing corn is actually seeing that cover crop stay alive. Um, and then in bare areas of the field, that cover crop takes off and grows. 
shades out weeds that could potentially have grown, um, takes up nutrients, takes in sunlight, and helps to hold the soil in place. Um, and there's quite a bit of work looking out there at some different cover crops, legumes, and things. They're not seeing a yield benefit where corn yields are increasing due to like nitrogen production, but they are also very little of the research is showing yield losses due to that cover crop established at that V4 to V5 time frame in the corn. Okay, and I'm going to pause for just a second. Um, I'm going to share my screen that has the, um, the QR code for the CCA credits. Um, but I'm going to continue to ask questions while this is up so people just have a couple minutes to um, get their information down. Uh, so the next question I have um, is, what is one of the most common misconceptions about using cover crops? I think sometimes one of the misconceptions is this will cost me less and I'll be able to, you know, do use less nutrients um, in my system. And I think that's, that's not necessarily true. Um, I think you need to look at that from that water quality soil health standpoint when you're thinking about this. And, and I always ask people the question, you know, what do you want in the next 50 years for that next generation to take over that farm? And while you're mining those nutrients out um, over time, you know, what are you doing to recuperate some of those nutrients? And so I think that's one of the things you need to think about with that. I think the one that I hear the most of is how is it going to pay? And it, you, you kind of got to look at that in a lot of different ways. I mean, I understand if you're renting a farm and you don't know if you're going to farm it for another year, but um, we just feel like it's really an important thing to keep our soil on the land and out of the streams and waterways. And I think that can be accomplished pretty darn quick. And in whether it's blowing in the winter months or even if it's residue, I get bummed out when I see my corn stalks or any of my residue leave the farm. I, I just trying to figure out how you, what we need to do there to address things like that. I don't want to see that. I want to, I want to keep everything where we, on the, on the land where we can use it. Okay, um, I see we're having some issues with the QR code. I will put that back up here in a couple minutes. Um, but the last question that I have is, uh, what are some benefits that took longer than you expected to see and how long did they take? I think one that takes longer is to build your soil health, like your uh, aggregate stability, that, that takes longer um, to see some of those improvements on in different soil types, uh, a coal wood soil versus a, a blount. It's gonna take longer to build that in that blount soil. I mean, you gotta be careful with weights, compaction, um, all that kind of stuff versus doing that on a coal wood. Coal wood, you can have that in pretty good shape in a couple of years if you, you know, if you um, back off the tillage and uh, incorporate a lot of cover crops. Um, it's going to take longer on some of the, the heavier clay content soils. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Those heavier clay content soils, you might not see um, those changes as quickly as maybe, you know, a sandier or a loamier soil. And I think making yourself and telling yourself, I'm going to try this more than just one year, you won't necessarily see, especially in a heavy clay soil, a huge difference in a one year time. I think on the years where it's maybe extremely wet or extremely dry, that's when you see your cover crop benefit more um, in that production system. And so being patient and saying, I'm gonna look at this 
and measure this at my first year and three years and five and seven and looking at, you know, what am I doing and, and changing that? But again, that soil health, that side, it just takes longer. Yeah, the soil health and the organic matter change, you know, a lot of guys go into it in the mindset they're going to see in their next grid sampling rotation, a change in organic matter. And a lot of times it's 10 years till they pick up a significant change of even a 10th of a percent in that organic matter. It just all depends on your soils um, and what their natural organic matter is and how they behave, how easy it's going to be to change something like organic matter. Um, so th that's the one that a lot of growers I work with get frustrated in is they think that organic matter is going to change. They go into it in the mindset they heard organic matter was going to change. Two or three crop rotations later, it hasn't changed. 20 years later, they're finally excited that they saw this small improvement in organic matter, but they're getting a lot of other benefits along the way that aren't organic matter changes. Um, often the quickest one you see is that change in water infiltration and the amount of time that ponded water stays on your field that you have the cover crop in um, versus where you don't. And even that's guys I work with that are in those tillage systems and using cover crops. I think that's one of the scary things for a lot of people is there's this mentality that cover crops only fit in the no-till system, but they can work well protecting soil and land and use your tillage system that you're comfortable with. And you see remarkable changes in that water infiltration with some of our heavy spring rains when we have that growing cover out on a chisel plowed field where that cover crop was and where it wasn't. Okay, um, it is past 1130. So I just quickly wanna mention, we do have one more question if you guys are willing to stick around, but um, we're having maybe some issues with the QR code um, for CCA credits. Um, if you are having issues, Bridget put in the chat, um, the link to the website to go to to fill it out um, I guess old school style if the QR code doesn't work um, and there should be a survey that pops up when you exit the webinar um, that we would love for you to respond to um, it'll help us figure out what to do for our future programs and just give us some feedback um, so the last question that came through the Q&A is um, what are your thoughts on precision cover crops with different species or mixes per row? I think the, the blends are the, the best way to go. And uh, you have to have some another crop or leave a farm set to get a blend out there and get the full advantage out of it. The more stuff you got out there growing, the, the better the odds are something's going to be very successful and you're going to see some nice return on that investment. But you really need to have wheat in a rotation to get the full benefit out of that kind of a um, mix. And I think the mixes behave differently um, every year. And like Les said, one year this might grow versus the next year. But I think the diversity, looking at what that does to that culture below the soil surface and how that changes is, is a key factor. Um, once you get to that point where you're ready to use those mixes, that diversity is, is key. Okay, um, and with that, that concludes our program for today. Um, I wanna thank all of the speakers and the moderators for their help putting this program together. Um, and a reminder again, this will be recorded and posted to YouTube and emailed, the link will be emailed out to everyone. Um, so thank you and have a great rest of your day.